Good afternoon and welcome to this week's edition of Bioanalytical Techniques 428, where we teach you uh, biochem and we make it great. Here on this week's episode, we will be discussing um, circular dichroism. Here's Ray for all your circular dichroism needs. Thanks, Jess. So this week we're going to be talking about circular dichroism. To begin with, you kind of have to know what the instrument looks like. So here are some of the basic models. You come from the basic teaching model all the way up to the specialized instrument that goes into much more detail and has a lot more features um, with the instrumentation. Interestingly enough, um, although the name says circular uh, in it, um, these instruments are actually box legs. So sorry for all you people who are expecting this to be um, a sphere or circular in some sort of way. So in order to understand circular dichroism, you kind of have to know how polarized light works. So you have a horizontal polarized light coming towards you, and you have a vertical polarized light coming towards you. Well, when those two are in phase, working together at the exact same time, they actually create a 45 degree linearly polarized light. However, um, if one of these different light sources becomes out of phase or slows down, then this actually disrupts this linearly polarized light. Instead of becoming a line at 45 degrees, it actually starts creating helices and becoming a circularly polarized light. So I will actually be referring to circularly polarized light as CPL. So, in a circular dichroism instrument, you actually have a quarter wave plate which intentionally slows down either the horizontal or the vertical uh, polarized light to create either a right-handed CPL or a left-handed CPL. And the right and left just differ in how the light is like spinning toward you. So like right-handed toward the right way, uh, to your right hand, left-handed to the, the left. Um, so what is circular dichroism? So you place a sample inside um, the area that you'll be testing and you either like um, project um, right-handed CPL or left-handed CPL. And the difference in the absorption of the right-handed CPL or left-handed CPL actually is circular dichroism. So a molecule that absorbs these different types of light differently actually is a chiral molecule, which we talked about in organic. So, just because organic has been a couple years, here's a quick little review. So, chirality is basically when you have two mirror image isomers that are not superimposable. They're also called enantiomers. So basically you can think about it as like your hand. You can see in the diagram behind me, but I like this example a little bit better. So basically you have your two hands, they're the same thing. You can turn them upside down, you can do different things with them. But if you try to put them on top of each other, it just doesn't work. They're not superimposable. So you can think of it like a chiral molecule. They're the exact same thing. They're just kind of, <coughs> excuse me, sorry about that, a little too excited. They're just fo figured a little bit differently. So when you have a chiral sample, because a chiral, a chiral molecule is actually required for circular dichroism, um, you put your sample in and it is irradiated with either right CPL or left CPL. And then it's actually going to absorb either more of the right CPL or the left CPL. They're not going to absorb the same amount for these. So the amount of um, the amount of light is going to be different for either the right CPL or the left CPL. But you also have two distinctive extinction coefficients um, that correspond to these two different lights. Uh, so, interestingly enough, you can actually look at a CD um, spectrum and figure out the protein secondary structure. So for instance, if you look at um, the wavelengths between 260 and 180, you can actually see alpha helices, beta sheets, and these beta sheets, you can either even see if they're parallel or anti-parallel. You can even see turns. So this is really, really, really useful for polypeptides and proteins. <coughs> Sorry, just way too excited. So also, it's very useful in determining the purity of a sample. So if you're looking for a specific enantiomer, you can use this to make sure that you got what you wanted. 
Um, specifically, I actually encountered this as a purity sample with hemoglobin. One of the studies for my senior research actually used circular dichroism to make sure that they got the correct hemoglobin that they wanted. So, let's talk about basically what CD can do. You can use um, circular dichroism to determine whether conformational changes occurred, estimate nucleic acid and protein conformations, you can even do kinetics of folding and unfolding of macromolecules. You can even determine binding constants, but you have to use a little bit of other techniques and a lot of math. So we're not going to go into too much detail here. So interestingly enough, there's a different type of unit that you use with circular dichroism. You have your normal absorbance values, but you also have ellipticity. So ellipticity is basically 32.98 um, times the change in absorbance. And the change of absorbance is just the amount of light, the left-handed light that was absorbed minus the amount of right-handed light absorbed. And again, you just multiply that by 32.98 and you get the um, milli-degrees of the ellipticity. So all the degrees that come, or the units rather, not the degrees, all the units of molar ellipticity are really historical. So you see on the screen behind me that they're degrees times centimeters squared all over decimals. So that's kind of like a weird thing for us chemists. We're used to millimoles, we're used to regular moles, uh, we're used to micromoles, but decimals, that's just a little odd for us. So again, this just comes back to how it was used earlier and it's just from the history. So if you wanted to calculate molar ellipticity, the sample concentration the cell path length and the molecular weight all would have to be known, or it just doesn't work. So, interestingly enough, some people in London, <coughs> excuse me, basically wanted to have a takeoff of PDB. So, we have PDB and we use it already with our molecular modeling and a lot of other things, which it provides the crystal structure, it provides basically any information you want to know about a certain protein. Well, these researchers in London at this university created basically the same database for circular dichroism. So they started it in 2009 and it's basically a public place where researchers can archive their spectroscopy from circular dichroism along with any information tied to that information. So I actually wanted to include one spectra and since hemoglobin is near and dear to my heart, I decided to include the one for it. So this actually came from the circular dichroism database and I would go into explaining exactly how um, the spectra explains um, what type of conformation and the different um, uh, specificities that go along with the spectra, um, but that's a little bit more than what we have time for. Um, that would take a lot of explanation that would be longer than 10 minutes. So we're just gonna suffice it, and you can actually see this. This is um, shows the alpha helices. This is basically a main um, characteristic of an alpha helices, which are prevalent in hemoglobin. So if you don't believe any of the things I have said previously, you can casually or look uh, formally look at all of these resources behind me, and I can send you my PowerPoint with the sources. But I hope you have learned a lot about circular dichroism. And back to you, Jess. Hi, y'all. I hope you learned a lot about um, circular dichroism in this week's section of bioanalytical techniques for 28. I hope we taught you some biochem, and I hope we made it great. Have a great afternoon.